Hello, hello, my true crime junkies. Welcome back. I'm Aira, your host. If you are new here on my podcast, welcome to True Crime Junkies. I hope you enjoy and make sure to subscribe and support our little our little podcast here. Um, I will be posting an episode each week and I may surprise you once in a while with a bonus episode. So make sure to stay tuned and follow us on Instagram. We are on True Crime Junkies. Uh, that's J-U-N-K-I-E-Z. And um, just join us in this journey. Um, We are posting this episode today with hope to bring more awareness to this case and hopefully more new leads as well. So we will be talking about, and uh, as of today, is unsolved. And um, at one point, it's thought to be closed, the case, but things took a turn which caused the case to get reopened um so as of right now it is an open case and we will be discussing the murder case of Jacqueline Dwallaby she was born May 17 of 1981 in Chicago Illinois she was born to Cynthia and Jimmy Guess which they divorced before she was born in the mid 80s Jacqueline Dwallaby was the seven-year-old daughter of Cynthia and now at that at this moment she was adopted by her second husband David and at this time this case occurs on September 10 of 1988 David and his son awoke early they made sure to stay quiet and not wake the rest of the family including his mother who lived in the basement However, at 7.15 a.m., David discovered the front door partially opened. At first, he thought that his mother had come home early, earlier and left the door open. Her car was not in the driveway, but he, he then assumed that she had left again while leaving the door open. Two hours later, Cynthia went into Jacqueline's room to wake her up, and however, Jacqueline wasn't in her room. They initially assumed that she was out playing with her friends out front. And after searching the home, David and his son went out searching for Jacqueline. They could not find no trace of her. And when Cynthia went back into Jacqueline's room, she discovered that her comforter was missing, which was very unusual as Jacqueline would never take it with her to go outside and play. And when Cynthia walked down her driveway to go to the neighbor's house, she noticed that the basement window had been broken. It appeared that an intruder had used it to gain entrance to the house. Within hours, the police and the FBI were at the Dowlaby household, waiting for a ransom demand. However, no call came. Four days later, unfortunately, Jacqueline's body was discovered in a vacant field near Blue Island, Illinois found that the scene was Jacqueline's comforter and a nightgown, along with rope that was around Jacqueline's neck. From the beginning, the investigation into Jacqueline's disappearance was two-pronged. While they pursued the possibility of a kidnapping, they began a detailed questioning of both Cynthia and David. The questions involve what Dualabies did the morning of Jacqueline's disappearance. Investigators believe that the basement window was broken from the inside to make it look like an intruder was responsible. Dust on the window sill had not been disturbed. On September 11, the day after Jacqueline's disappearance, David agreed to take a polygraph examination at the FBI headquarters in Chicago. An agent told David that he had passed the examination. Three days later, passed with no leads on that on the day that Jacqueline's body was found David was asked to take another polygraph the results of this test were inconclusive with the examiner claiming that David was uncooperative David however claimed that the examiner told him to answer yes to every question including questions did you kill your daughter to which David said he refused to respond with a yes 
And after the second polygraph, David was interrogated for five hours, very long hours before an officer interrupted. The officer said that Jacqueline's body was found. David believed that the police officer were, was, were lying to him in order to get him to confess. However, when he came home to find Cynthia crying, he knew that the news was true. An autopsy was unable to determine when Jacqueline was murdered. On September 17, she was laid to rest. The investigation now involved the Illinois State Police, the Mytholian Police, and the Blue Island Police. For two months, they gathered evidence and built a case against the Dwallabies, which is her mom and her stepdad. Finally, in November of 1988, David and Cynthia Dwallaby were arrested and charged with Cynthia's murder. Cynthia was two months pregnant at this point. The couple insisted that they were innocent. Jacqueline's adopted father, David, whose trial in the killing began, originally suggested that the birth father, Jimmy Guess, which is Cynthia's first husband, might have adopted her. He may have kidnapped her, her biological father. During this time, Jimmy Guess, which is the biological father, is an inmate in the Avon Park, Florida Penitentiary, has a very special interest in the outcome of this trial with Cynthia and David Dwallaby of the murder of their seven-year-old daughter, Jacqueline. Jimmy Guess, who's been in prison in Florida for almost two years, Guess is also very angry that he can't be at this trial. In the first interview he has given it um, about the murder case, Guess was 31 years old, said he is bitter both about the murder of his daughter and about being initially a suspect in her disappearance. He, in an interview, he stated, quote, given during this um, during this interview, I want to be there because she was my child. That was the only thing I thought I did right in my life. End quote. He was devastated and completely angry that he was being accused of something when he was not even in the state when she disappeared. And he, the way he found out was very upsetting to him. At the start of the couple's murder trial, Cynthia and David, in the Cook County Criminal Court, prosecutors contend, contended the Dwallabies had blundered by implicating guests, which is the biological father, because unbeknown to the rest of the family, he had been in prison for four months earlier. So he had an actual alibi four months prior to her disappearing her biological father was in prison in another state so there was definitely no way that he kidnapped her no reason why but defense the defense lawyer argued there was wasn't anything sinister about the dwallabies quickly blaming the biological father years earlier they said that guess had broken into the home of Cynthia's parents in an unsuccessful attempt to snatch Jacqueline away from her mom during their bitter divorce custody battle. They had a bitter divorce right before Jacqueline was born. Eventually, Guess moved away. He went moved to Florida to do some construction work. On May 23rd of 1988, he ended up getting sentenced to seven years in prison. For two counts of a sexual battery threatening with a deadly weapon and one count of attempt of sexual battery. Guess said that the incident involved a woman he had met at a bar. It was a one-time situation that ended bad. So this is where during that four-month period is when Jacqueline disappears while he is being sentenced to prison. In September of 1988, Guess the biological father said he learned from an FBI agent that Jacqueline had disappeared. 
At that moment, he'd just gotten his seven-year sentence when this FBI agent told him the bad news. So it was multiple hits for him. In April of 1990, now David and Cynthia Dwallaby went on trial for Jacqueline's murder. The prosecution had built this case mainly on circumstantial evidence. The one prosecution witness, a transit worker named Everett Mann, had picked David out of a photo lineup. He claimed that on the night of Jacqueline's murder, he had seen a man with a prominent nose that looks just like David's, the stepdad, sitting in a parked car near the site where Jacqueline's body was found. The defense felt that this identification was ridiculous. Everett was at least 75 feet away from the car and it was dark, moonless night. Also, the photo spread that Everett was shown were frontal photographs even though Everett saw the person from the side view. David's photograph was also larger than the other four photographs. So before the trial, two other eyewitnesses claimed that they had seen Cynthia's car near the area where Jacqueline's body was found. However, these sightings were discredited because it was confirmed that Cynthia's car was in front of the Dwallaby's home at the time of the sightings. Another issue is the prosecution case involved the basement window. A forensic analysis was done on the window to determine if it had been broken from the inside or the outside of the home. The report concluded that the window had actually been broken from the outside. But by this time, the Dwallabies had already been arrested. The prosecution also questioned whether it was possible for someone to enter the house without disturbing the items below the basement window. There were several items including a nightstand, a towel rack, a TV tray, and a makeup tray. None of these items were disturbed. To prove that this was a possible, that this was possible, David shot a video showing a neighbor entering through the basement window. The neighbor was able to wedge his leg on the wall and enter without disturbing anything. Other prosecution evidence included blood stains, pillow found in Jacqueline's bedroom, head hair similar to Jacqueline's found in the trunk of her parents' car, her brother claiming that she got spanked a lot by their parents, and neighbors identifying the rope that killed Jacqueline as one that her brother often played with. However, the blood on the pillow could not be identified and the hairs could not be confirmed as coming from Jacqueline's. The defense focused on a convict sex offender, Perry Hernandez, who committed a similar abduction one year earlier after Jacqueline's murder. The Dolabies never testified during the trial. Before closing arguments, the judge addressed both legal teams without the jury present. He decided that the case against David Walt Dolaby would continue as scheduled, However, he felt that there was insufficient evidence for Cynthia's case to be put on, to put to the jury. The jury deliberated for three days before finding David Dwallaby guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to 45 years in prison. Cynthia and friends of the family created a grassroots movement in an attempt to get David released. The movement caught the attention of legal journalist David Protest. In several articles, he criticized the conviction of David Dwallaby. Paul Hogan worked with protests to create a series of investigative journalism reports in an attempt to get David Dwallaby released. In October of 1991, Illinois' Court of Appeal reversed David's conviction and ordered him to be released immediately. However, some investigators are still convinced that David Dwallaby is responsible for Jacqueline's murder. David and Cynthia Dwallaby are still searching for Jacqueline's real killer as of today. So right now, so far as suspect, some authorities do still believe that David Dwallaby, the stepdad, is still a suspect. And they've also have two other suspects that have been considered and dismissed as having alibis. So, at the end of the day today, the case is still unresolved, and after several broadcasts, 
you know, a couple of interviews. Um, the suspect was Timothy Guess, Jacqueline's biological uncle. That was one suspect. And um, Guess, a diagnosed schizophrenic, claimed that he was working at the local restaurant on the night of Jacqueline's mother, which is her, again, Timothy Guess, her, her uncle. And at least five regular patrons at the restaurant have stated that Timothy Guess, her uncle, was not there that night. Also, one of the Guest's original alibi witnesses has since changed her story. Guess also had links to the apartment next to where Jacqueline's body was found. So they're talking about Timothy Guess, which is Jacqueline's uncle on her biological father's side of her family. So he's still on the top of the list of suspects right now as of today. Um, so Jacqueline's case is staying, re- you know, staying open as of right now by the state attorney's office. Um, however, charges were really never filed against Timothy Guess. And according to journalist David Protest, Guess later told him that a spirit that lived inside him had told him details about Jacqueline's murder. Timothy Guess told Protest about the layout of the Dwallaby's home even though he had never been inside. He also knew that a light was on Jacqueline's closet, but no other, but not in her bedroom. This details was never released to the public. Despite evidence against him, Timothy Guess was never charged, and he ended up dying in 2002. Now, another suspect convicted sex offender, Perry Hernandez, he was investigated Um, He had committed a similar abduction one year after Jacqueline's murder. However, evidence found on Jacqueline's body did not match him, and he was cleared by the authorities. Now, the Dwallabies have since moved and changed their last names due to public publicities from this case, and they still hope to find her, the murderer, and get some justice for Jacqueline. And for right now, the case is still open, um, and they're hoping to get some good leads. So if anyone knows anything, have any information, remembers anything about Jacqueline's case, please contact um, the Chicago, Illinois authorities and report this information to help this family get some closure and justice for this little girl that did nothing wrong and had this sad way she died and disappeared so please make sure to share this if you know anybody have any information please contact the chicago police and give this information and help the family and let's just bring more awareness to this if you share this discuss it with other people hopefully someone knows something or knows somebody that knows something and let's try and help I really hope you guys enjoy this and I will be posting another one very soon. Make sure to not forget to subscribe and support this podcast. I really appreciate everybody and I do love what I'm doing here and I really hope everybody enjoys this and supports me. So I will talk to you guys soon. Thank you again to all my friends, the True Crime Junkies. And I will be speaking to you guys soon. Bye.